I am a midwife and really love that work. It's just a work that I find um, miraculous and I love to be, even at a really hard birth, I, I love being there and being with a woman uh, to, to walk with her on this journey into motherhood. Uh, I had a 30-year career in training and organizational development. I started teaching back in 1980 and um, developed my career from there. I'm a single mom supporting my kids, so teaching didn't make enough money, and so I moved into corporate training and, and on. With moms, uh, I like our acronym much better than I like our full name. Um, I am the director of education and the secretary of the board of directors. Moms is a dinky, tiny little organization, and it's mostly me working full-time as a volunteer. My wife works part-time as a volunteer, and then we have miscellaneous other volunteers um, to pick up the slack. What I'm going to be talking about this morning is um, female genital cutting, and it's um, something that takes place in much of Africa and South Asia, although it is generally perceived as um, a religious thing, it's often associated with Muslim, it is not a religious based action. Um, it is cultural, not religious. A lot of people have attempted to end the practice, but um, it's pervasive. The former Pre, uh, the, the wife of the former president of Sierra Leone, which is the country where we work primarily, um, was a large, huge, enormous, annoying advocate of the process and everybody that was trying to do things in the country to stop the practice of cutting uh, were stymied by Mrs. President. Um, and it was, it was very, very difficult. Uh, we actually have a pretty effective approach in our little low-key, quiet sort of way, and I'll be talking about that. And we are actually proof that long-held traditions can be changed. Female genital cutting, um, a lot of people are a little squeamish about asking what it is, and in some venues I actually show pictures uh, and decided to forbear here. But it is the partial or total removal of the tissue between a woman's legs. And this can vary from a tiny little nick to um, essentially s slicing open the skin, scraping out the, the underlying tissue, and then stitching the skin back closed. Um, this has enormous ramifications to a way a woman has sex, has babies, urinates, and even defecates. Um, it can, um, if a woman survives the procedure, she often ends up infected and will die or be even further maimed from the infection. Some women have this excision is so radical that on their wedding night, she has to be surgically opened uh, to be able to have sex with her, with her husband. Other women, you can hardly see a difference. The, the practice officially is divided into four categories, but the, it's arbitrary and varies hugely. The prevalence of, of this is pretty widespread. Um, there are places in Africa that have never heard of it. Uh, we're going to be working in Uganda, and the midwives there had never heard of this practice and never seen it when I asked them about it. And yet where I am in Sierra Leone, in the rural areas, virtually every woman, at, when she reaches the age of puberty, has had this done. Now, people say, why on earth do they do that? And my usual response is, so why do they practice male circumcision? And the, and the answers are, are, are in many ways very similar. Um, female women are cut uh, as a sign that they're ready to enter adulthood. It prepares the girl to be a woman. It's the initiation ritual into the women's society. Uh, it helps her stay clean. It helps her control her power. 
and most of all, it is tradition. So I work for this organization called MOMS, and uh, we are a humanitarian agency, and we travel to Sierra Leone and Uganda um, primarily. We, in Sierra Leone, we teach the birth attendants, who are also the cutters, we teach the birth attendants how to become change agents in their communities. And one of the things they do in our preparation is make a p commitment to doing only what is good for women. And they are, they are ready to make that commitment. They don't always know what is good for women, but they're ready to commit to that. And um, so just a, a brief, a lot of people don't know where Sierra Leone is. I can't leave the microphone. So Sierra Leone is over on the west coast. You may have heard of it recently because of Ebola. Uh, and right as of right now, 6,000 people in Sierra Leone have died of Ebola. Currently, currently about 4,000 are sick. Um, and there are four Ebola hospitals with 190 beds each for these people. Um, Ebola right now is something that um, is tearing my heart out by the roots. 25 of my friends have died. They have been um, taking care of the sick people. The clinics there don't have gloves, masks, gowns. And when the first sick came into the clinics, um, my friends took care of them and as a result contracted the disease and died. And so you can see a map of Sierra Leone, and you can see this village where we worked was one of the first places hit. These people were being taken over here to this hospital in Kinema. They stopped in Daru because the people were so sick, and they died in Daru. And my friends work in that clinic there, and they died too. So that's a little bit why I get emotional about this. Okay, so let's talk about how moms makes change. And one of the things is that I want you to know is that as I go through these slides, after I go through these slides, I'm going to ask a series of questions and that'll be a good point for you to start making notes so that you can think about how you might apply our model in your situation. When we go in to teach these folks, um, they, we, we recognize that these are farm women, their fingernails have dirt encrusted in them. They scrub them assiduously, but their hands are stained from farming. They, most of them have never had their butt in a classroom in their entire lives. Many of the women that we teach spent their early adult or teen years uh, in the, during the Sierra Leonean Civil War, the Child Soldier War, where rampaging hordes were running through the jungles, cutting off each other's hands. Uh, rape was the weapon of choice for many. Uh, Charles Taylor from Liberia, he was the president of Liberia, and he invaded through this area where we work, the Kalam district, um, and on his way to the diamond fields. And um, he would impress he would kidnap basically the little boys of a village, get them um, doped up, a lot of cocaine, and then set them back into the village to rape and burn, um, to rape their mothers and sisters and burn their village down. So there's a lot of trauma in this region, and there's a huge divide between us and them. Uh, we are mostly white, middle class women with degrees and advanced degrees. Um, and the essential, the very most essential element of making change is building a partnership. So how do you build a partnership with somebody whose values, whose experience, whose lives are so different from yours? And that was the challenge that we faced. Building a partnership with these women with whom we don't share a language, we don't share most of our life experience. Um, to look at our lives, you would say there's just nobody more different from me on earth. 
women living in jungle and thatch roof houses, um, hauling water for miles every day, um, working in swamps, growing rice. That's, that's a far cry from my life. But this, this mutual respect is essential. And part of that respect is then when we approach teaching is to explain why. These folks have had some training in some cases about how to deliver babies safely, but they don't know why anything happens. They have lists of things that they memorize. They make songs about in order to help them memorize, and that's what they know. So they, there is a list, there is a song and a list about the women that they cannot care for, and they will chant. They will dance around the room chanting, you know, young women, old women, women with deformities, you know, women who have had bleeding in previous pregnancies. They've memorized this list, and they don't know why. Why don't you, why can't I deliver a woman who is under the age of 18? Why can't I deliver a woman who's, who's shorter than five feet tall? Why can't I deliver a woman who has had a hemorrhage in a previous birth? They have no idea. They know they can't. And so when a woman is five feet and an inch and has had four eight-pound babies, they think they can't deliver her because they don't know why they're not supposed to deliver her. We explain why. We explain lots of whys. And we talk about anatomy and physiology. And a lot of people say, well, you can't teach an ignorant woman anatomy and physiology. And it's like, well, yeah, we can't. And we do. And we talk about the skin, and we talk about how the skin works to protect you, and we talk about how the skin stretches around your body, and we talk about how scar tissue doesn't stretch nearly so well as regular skin. And they go, okay, yeah, we, we know that. They, they, when, um, as they come of age, they do tattoos and scarring on their face and, and bodies, and they know that these t tissues don't stretch. They're African, and they often develop keloids. So we talk about scar tissue and how scar tissue doesn't stretch. And then I teach them about childbirth and how a woman needs to have time to stretch for her baby to, to be born. And if um, you rush a delivery uh, through various artificial means, which they do, they usually will push on the woman's belly to push the baby out. Um, and I talk about why that's a problem, and it is a huge problem to do that. Uh, and I, t I explain why, and they go, oh, okay, cool. And then I talk about, but you don't want to delay a delivery because that causes problems too. And they go, oh, okay, wait a minute. So, so a woman needs time to stretch, and of course we know that scar tissue doesn't stretch, but we don't want to delay the birth, so... If we have a slow birth because of the scar tissue that doesn't stretch, we're killing babies. It's like, mm, yeah, you got it. These women are ignorant, certainly. They're ignorant, and they're not stupid. And that, in terms of making change and that respect that you have to have, is, is people sometimes do ignorant things. People sometimes do abominable things. Often it is out of ignorance. And those people are typically are not stupid. So finding that way to respect their intelligence, even if you don't like their conclusions, is an important part of that foundation of respect and building a partnership. So that's always something that we have to, to manage our responses to when we hear about things. It's like, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, please, please, please don't use fundal pressure to push out a baby. Please, you know, if you're trying to transport her, don't tie her legs together so that she uh, doesn't have her baby until you can get her to the hospital. Please don't do those things. And again, they're trying, they're doing the best they know how to do. They don't understand foundational kinds of things and they make poor decisions because they don't understand why. Listen to concerns. They will tell us sometimes about, well, if we change this process or this procedure or this activity or if we stop cutting, what's going to happen to the girls? The men won't marry them. And we go, yeah, that's a problem. That's a real problem. And I don't have a pat solution to it. 
I don't, I don't have an answer. And the concern is real. And then we move into our problem-solving model, and we, we teach a very specific problem-solving model, and we teach it again and again and again. We model it, and we teach it several times through the course. Uh, and it's, it's simple. Identify the problems, identify the causes, generate as many solutions as you can, prioritize and implement the solutions, and then evaluate the change and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. Making change is a long-term process. It's not something that you do overnight. It's not something that, that happens quickly. It's not something that happens easily. And throughout all of this, we work diligently to continue to, to show our respect, not just have the respect, but to show it and to be integrated in our approach to them. Um, and then we also rejoice in any incremental changes. This woman here, I just, I love this woman. I loved her so much. Her name is Bindu Tejan, and Auntie Bindu. And the, um, the day we taught this about women take time to stretch at childbirth, um, she stood like this, and she kind of nailed me with this expression. Uh, and it was like, all right, you. And she adjusted her dress. She said, okay. My name is Bindu Tejan, and I am the head traditional birth attendant of this class. I am the head woman of this village. And we promise to do only what is good for women. And you have taught us that cutting is not good for women. We will not cut. And say, like, well, Auntie Bindu, um, Wonderful, 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 wonderful. And Auntie Bindu, ha did you hear that yesterday some women reporters who were reporting on this topic of, of cutting were kidnapped, stripped, and paraded through town naked? And the American embassy had to intervene to get these women set free. And she stood up again, and again that same expression, My name is Bintu Dejan. I am the head traditional birth attendant. I am the head woman of this village. You taught us that this is not good for women. We will not cut. Okay, Auntie Bindu, you will not cut. Um, six months later, of course, Auntie Bindu died of malaria. But we had similar experiences, different but with the final same results in all of these villages. We've, we've, we deal with five groups of people right now. Uh, we've not been allowed to go back in and, and teach our sixth and seventh cohorts because of Ebola. Um, Peli, the Mami Lamin, is the um, head traditional birth attendant there. And when we taught them this, she, she came to us after class and said, okay, we understand what you're saying and we're, n we're not going to cut. And so we, we talked it through with her. And, and then when we came back to see her six months later, she said, you know, what I'm doing now is I'm just actually making a slit, just a tiny little cut that, that long at the very top of the clitoris because the men just went out of their minds at the thought of these girls growing up and and not being marriageable. It was the fathers who were just absolutely freaking out that they wouldn't be able to get rid of their daughters. Um, and she says, so I make this little tiny cut. Is that okay? It's like, you tell me. Is it okay? And she said, it's what I have to do for now. I was like, okay, then that's what you do for now. You make incremental changes. You, you come up with a solution that works in your environment that minimizes the damage. Sometimes minimizing damage, it's like the old controversy about um, needle sharing and stuff, giving, giving clean needles to people so that they're not uh, sharing needles and, and spreading HIV, <clears throat> the whole harm reduction um, principles. Then um, about two years ago, I was talking with mommy again, 
And she said, I want to tell you something. Okay. She said, ever since you trained us the first time, every woman I deliver, I watch. And I see that the women who have had the most extensive cutting are the ones that have the problems with delivery. And those are the ones that I sometimes have to transport to the hospital because I, I see that the birth is going to take too long. And I see now what you're talking about. I've seen it from myself. And so all the women now around here who are cutters are just making the little nick like I do. It's like, beautiful. And she said, in, in five years, I'm not going to make the nick anymore. By then, the men should have figured things out that, that girls that aren't, aren't cut are really okay. I'm going to give them five years, and then I'm going to stop. Like, beautiful, Mommy. Beautiful. I love it. This is Fina. And the picture on the left uh, is taken while she and her, mo her, her mother and her grandmother were in our class. And she spent four weeks rolling around on that lapa, um, playing with her feet, playing with a stick that she was using as a doll, um, playing with a rock that she called her doggy. Um, you know, the kids don't have toys, so sticks and rocks are their babies and their, and their doggies. And on um, the picture on the right, you see her, this was taken in, in March of this year, and she's 12 years old. She's, she started her, her monthly bleeding the month before. She would have been taken out and cut, and she wasn't. And she's becoming quite, quite the young lady. She was so excited. She came running up and, see my new dress? I got a dress. She's so proud. So looking down on the practitioners of the, of, of the practices you don't like is, is a real ineffective way to, to make change, to impose change from the outside or above. Take, that's that whole patriarchal, colonial perspectives that, that are just so integrated into our way of thinking. We don't always, we don't always know what, what, that we're doing it. One of the problems that we've faced there is in making this change is there are some other groups that have come in very prescriptively and told them that this was an evil practice and they were dirty, evil people for doing this practice. And so we have to overcome a lot of the resentment, a lot of the anger um, that, that the people experience from being treated so disrespectfully, tr being treated like they're stupid, um, being treated like they're, they're just, you know, s some kind of subhuman thing. Of course, we're dealing with white people going into Africa, which... And there is a long, horrid tradition of white people going into Africa and treating them like they're stupid, stupid children. So the whole thing about respect is it, it takes time. For someone to respect you and listen to you, you have to earn their trust. And that's earning trust, not, not expecting trust, not demanding trust, and explaining what the effects are. There's, there's, Bethany was talking about how in their curriculum they want to, to talk to people about child development and you know what goes on with kids when they have certain experiences of certain kinds. Um, and it's that, that ex explanation of, wow, I didn't know that it had that effect. And, and give people a way to learn so that they can make their own decision to change instead of enforcing change. And part of what we face is that we set up the women to make changes. We teach them a problem-solving model, and then we leave them to it. And sometimes they identify problems that we don't think are problems. They identify solutions that we think are horrible solutions. And we have to just bite our tongues because it's not our problem, it's not our solution, it's not our change. It's not ours. It's theirs. They have to figure out 
what their problems are, what their priorities are, what the solutions are that will work for them. And sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, that happens. That happens. They, some, we've had, <laughs> we had this one situation where the women, we, we give the women this small grant to start a business and they entrusted one of the village elders with their money and lo and behold the money disappeared. And so they came back to us and wanted more money. And we didn't know what to do. We really didn't know what to do. Uh, but we gave them some more money. We gave them half the original amount. And they gave the money in this time to the male head of the clinic. And the money disappeared again along with the books that we'd left them and all of our uh, all of the supplies that we'd left them and they wanted more money and it was like no no we don't have any more if, if we give you money then we can't give other people money we we're just we're not save the children we're not <laughs> world vision you know save the children has a seventy thousand dollar a day budget for Sierra Leone and our annual budget is $70,000. So, you know, we're, we're talking some big, big differences there. And they went, oh, okay. But what we had to do is let them make their own mistakes. And then we had to learn that we don't let them do anything. That's just the wrong language. So this has been an evolving process for us and a learning process for us well, we don't let them do things. They do things, and we are their partners, and this notion of letting them is something that we just have to erase from our brains. We form a partnership with them. They have roles and responsibilities. We have roles and responsibilities. They tend to their roles and responsibilities. We tend to ours. We work together. We trust each other. We make mistakes, they make mistakes, and it's a process. So, just for grins, if you ever want to talk more to me, um, that's how to, how to get me. And so what I'd like to do now is give you the chance to ask questions. And um, what I, I, I kind of changed what I was doing. I kind of incorporated this whole into, you know, you know, what, how you can adapt it, I kind of incorporated it into this. But just briefly, I want to review the steps for what we do, the breakdown of the steps that we do, so you can think about them for, for the work that you do in, in your various locations. And the first thing we do is we, dis, we get real specific about this behavior that we want to change. We assess the needs. We, we know what it is that we want. And we also think about why we want it changed. We wanted to change female genital cutting. Now, we might want to change it because we think it's icky. We might think it's disgusting. We might think these people are horrible. Um, and that's pretty lousy reasoning for doing any kind of thing. That tells you more about me than it does about the practice. Do you see that distinction? It's what I think about something, not what the practice is. And the second part is, the next part is to find the respect for the people. There's different ways of doing that, but finding that respect, finding some basis for that respect, because if you don't have that respect, it's not going to happen. You're not going to build a partnership. Think about what you sound like. Look in a mirror when you talk about this thing, whatever it is, your cause, your passion, corporal punishment. Uh, child sexual abuse, whatever, whatever it is. Look in the mirror when you talk about it. Are you angry? Does your face turn red? Does your voice get strident? Listen to yourself. Do you repeat your story over and over again from your point of view? What are those things that you're doing? And what does that tell you about yourself and your cause and your approach to your cause and your approach to your partners? your partners in change. If you come off red-faced, shrill, and t keep talking about your story as if you were still a victim, 
how are you going to form a partnership with anyone for change? You may be able to do it. I don't know. I can't. Because my own needs are then driving the relationship, and it's not a partnership. I'm pushing. I'm driving. If the focus is primarily on yourself, your own values or your own experiences, you're not going to connect. So doing your own work of healing is an essential thing. And healing, I'm, I'm, I'm a battered wife. And it, it, much of it was done in the name of my husband's, my, ex, my ex-husband's religious perspectives. It was not a systematic thing of the denomination we were in. It was, this man's crazy. Um, and I had a lot of work to do. I started to work on a domestic violence hotline. And it was like, no, I can't do this yet. <laughs> you know, it's still too much about me and my own healing and projecting my own stuff on these people who were calling me. A year later, I was able to do it. Um, but at, at initially, I realized I still had more therapy to do. So this is the kinds of things that, that thinking about, if, you, if you've been working on an area and you haven't been making progress, these are some questions that you can ask yourself. Or as you prepare to work in an area, you know, run, run this check. Run this check on yourself. Identifying with the abusers is also an important part of this. Finding a way to identify with them and respect them. Finding a way to identify and respect victims as something not you. Have that boundary. It's not you. It's not your stuff. As a midwife, one of the things that we do, especially if, if a woman has had a hospital birth and then wants to have a home birth with a midwife, and we've all given births. I have some pretty horrible stories about birthing my children in the hospital where I was abused during that process. Um, and I talk to the women that I'm going to be delivering, and it's not my birth. Maybe they want these things. It's their choice. It's their birth. It's not my birth. So I can identify them with them as women. I can identify with them as women becoming mothers. But projecting over identification, having those boundaries, it's not mine. And the issues that you face, it's not yours. But it is a victim's. And how do you identify? And then those who move on to survivor, from, from victimhood to survivorhood, and, and identifying with that. So considering what makes a good partnership, mutual respect, using your strengths deliberately to balance their weaknesses, and accepting their strengths to balance your weaknesses, that bilateral commitment to common goals and honesty, the things that make an ineffective partnership, manipulation, hypocrisy, overpersonalization of issues, domination. So you start by building that rapport, building the trust, earning the trust. You establish the common rules and ground, ground, the common ground rules and the roles and responsibilities. You identify what's going to kill success, and you identify what success looks like. You can get pretty specific. Success is, in six months, if we can you know, sit at a table without me wanting to reach over and slap his face. You know, that's, that's success. And I still want to slap my ex-husband's face. I can't, I can't sit with him at a table for 30 minutes. And then follow some kind of problem-solving process as you work together as partners. Does that all make sense? So, what questions do you have for me? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, we, ha we have to do microphones. Um, I was just curious. Um, you, you mentioned the, 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 the birth, what did you call it? The people who are in charge of birthing. Of, the, the birth attendants. Birth attendant, okay. Call them TBAs. <laughs> okay. That, that, that's easy. Um, 
that, that she had noticed that um, women who had been cut had a more difficult time in childbirth. I was, could you elaborate on what um, they might experience differently from someone who didn't? Sure. Um, have you had a baby? No. Okay. I have to have a date first. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. There's, there's a sequence of events that has to occur. It, it's hard. Um, okay, so as, as a woman births, a, a baby's head is about 10 centimeters in diameter. And a woman's vagina is normally less than that. And it's made up of heavily vascularized tissue that stretches. And so as the baby comes through, each contraction kind of pushes and opens and pushes and opens. And that baby's head, the baby's doing this, working its way through. Have you ever put on a turtleneck sweater and you do this? Well, that's what the baby's doing. The baby's working his head through the birth canal, through the vagina, and out the introitus. And that takes some time, just, you know, moving that baby through. If a woman doesn't stretch, the opening will, say, say the opening will come to here, and then it stops. And so then what you have to do, usually then, is, is cut the woman. Now, this woman has been already cut a lot before, uh, and if you are not aware of the woman's musculature, you can cut the muscles to the clitoris. You can cut uh, the muscles that help control defecation, um, and uh, the whole, uh, you can end up pretty much destroying your pelvic floor in terms of continence and any kind of pleasure at all uh, in sex. And so the baby will, if you don't cut, the baby will die, and the women will often die. Um, the the um, FGMs that I have seen, I've seen uh, various degrees. Um, but when it's practiced with the sewing shut, um, do, are they, what do they do with that? Do they, they cut when, when the, um, the sutures, I guess, um, when they go into labor, or it, de it depends. It depends on how how severe the cutting is. They will usually cut them the first time on their wedding night, or the first time they have sex. Um, it's a polygamous society, and marriage is pretty loose over there. So th when they start to have sex, they will they will cut them, and frequently they will cut up above the um, the clitoris, they'll cut forward on a woman's body. Um, and then when it comes time to give birth, they will typically cut at the 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock position. So on the wedding night, they get cut at 12 o'clock if, if she's lying on her back. And then, and then at delivery at the, at the 4 and 8. So basically, she's, you know, laid open like this. Is that... I'm I'm sorry, I'm hogging all the questions. Did, if, um, on the wedding night or whatever night, is the woman's chivalrous partner doing this cut? cut no, usually or? they bring in the woman. Uh, if the gotcha. man is an, if the man, can, can I swear? Okay, if the man's an asshole, he'll just go ahead and tear her open. Um, but if he's, you know, any kind of a nice guy, and most of the guys there are pretty nice guys, um, and the, they'll cut in the, the birth attendant who will, who will cut her. I want to thank you for your work, which I think is so important. I had two questions regarding the context. I was wondering, one, if the Ebola crisis might be a window to reduce um, FGM because, you know, blood, blood, bloodborne illnesses and so on. And then I also was wondering about the context of war of Sierra Leone. I'm sure there were... I think there were many sexual assaults. Yes. And um, I imagine um, the suffering for a woman is that much greater who's, who's had FGM. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah. Um, in terms of Ebola, my guess is that the incidence of the, the, the reduction of FGM is going to be stopped for a while because I think with the trauma and the fear that they're experiencing with Ebola, they're going to cling to their traditions for, for stability. Just a guess. <coughs> I don't know. 
I, I can't get there, which is making me crazy. Um, I need to ask our staff to check that. That's a great question. Um, and then as a result of the war and the rapes, um, probably 90% of the women were raped during the war. Um, if they weren't raped by the soldiers coming through, they were, if they weren't raped by the rebels, they were raped by the, the government soldiers, and if they weren't raped by either of them, when they got moved to the refugee camps, they were raped by who, whoever. And if they weren't raped, then they were raped after they got home. Um, I know of two women there who have not been raped. Um, and yeah, I, I, m most of the women I know have PTSD to some, sen some degree or another. Now, I use the term PTSD carefully because it is a DSM-4 DSM classified illness. I'm not talking about someone who just had a really freaky experience and is, is you know, jittery. I'm talking about full-blown, official, diagnosable PTSD. Uh, and most of them have it. They have, they have night terrors. They're hypervigilant. They're jittery. Um, they have flashbacks. You know all the things. Um, and a lot of the men have PTSD too from the things they either had done to them or were forced to participate in. So my question has to do with biting your tongue bloody. As a survivor and as someone with maybe opposing beliefs in a conversation with others, there seems to be a slippery slope between holding true to yourself and your worldview and what's important to oneself, but engaging in conversation. Um, what are the ways in which you determine whether you've overstepped the line in creating that partnership and losing yourself, and um, in, in reverse, um, impeding on that partnership or not creating it because you've spoken too much? It's hard. It, it's, it's, it's hard. And um, part of what we have come to understand and, and is that we cannot, to do our work effectively, we cannot engage in what we rather disparagingly refer to as, um, uh, you know, uh, hel hel uh, paratrooper charity. I mean, we, we, we don't parachute in, do our good things, and then split. That, that doesn't work for us. Uh, we have to build those relationships. We have to sit at night with Mommy Lamine in the dark and cry with her as she tells us the story of, of, of her daughter. We, we have to, to sit with them and be with them as women and as human beings who share grief, who share joy, and building that kind of relationship and earning their trust by listening to them. And there are times when we say too much and we have to come back and say, you know, we blew it, we're, you know, we screwed up. We, we, we crossed a boundary, and, and we're sorry. We don't want to do that again. You know, help us, help us learn better so that, we don't, so that we don't do that again. And then there are times where we have to say, you know, there's something we've been thinking about, and it's really uncomfortable for us, and we don't know how to approach it with you, and this is what it's about. What would be a good way to talk with you about it? And we work through a translator who is an absolute genius. And there are many times when we say to her, Jita, go figure out what we did wrong. <laughs> you know? what, what? There's something wrong and we don't know what it is. And we don't know if we've overstepped. We don't know if we've understepped. We don't know what we've done. And can you, you know... Can you help us figure it out? And she'll go, well, yeah, Mama, you, you did this and you did that and you did the other thing. And it's like, oh, shit. Um, okay, let's, let's figure out how, to make, how, to, how do we make this better. But it's an iterative process. It's a long-term commitment. It's a relationship. It's not, it's not par, you know, paratrooping in and, 
and then splitting. Thanks for thanks for answering the question about translation because that's what I are you doing this in English? No. Yeah, no. The the women um, English is the official language, but probably maybe half the guys speak English, and maybe 15 to 20 percent of the women speak English, but they don't speak it well enough to listen right. to to learn from us. Right. So uh, we use Creole a lot, um, and and then. And I can speak some Creole, and I understand Creole pretty well. But Mende, pff, I don't get Mende. I can't do it. I actually have a question as well. Um, I was wondering if um, if you run into the issue of if there's any backlash with it, like um, the one woman who's died now, if there's a sense of, well, she's trying to change our traditions, and of course now she has malaria and she's gone. But that it kind of that spiritualistic uh, retribution kind of thing. Are you, do you run into that? And if you are running into it, how do you deal with it? We don't run into it a whole lot, partly because of all the ground up work that we've laid up front. Um, and, and the fact is that the women work pretty collaboratively. The, the women themselves, they meet, they talk. There's not a lot of hierarchy among the women. There's the mommy queen, and she's the mommy queen. Um, but even she doesn't give orders to the people in the, uh, to the other women in the village. Um, so it's, it's pretty much a grassroots thing that, um, that they're, they're coming to a consensus to make these changes. So when, when Mommy Bindu um, got sick, you know, the women just grieved. And, you know, and her assistant slept with her for three days after she died. And, you know, all the, all the, honor, you know, the honor traditions. So they're talking on the side after oh, yeah. and coming to consensus. And then when she stood up to speak, she's speaking for everybody because she has the voice of the group. Yes. She's a, she's a spokesperson and, and a leader. She, she's definitely a thought leader. Um, but she wouldn't get up and speak for the people without their, without their, um, without their input and without their favor. Okay, one more brief question. Well, we don't even have to do that. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome.